On Thursday morning, in my devotional time, this is the passage I was reading. And I'd like to start sharing my message this morning by reading it again. Then his mother and his brothers arrived, and standing outside, this is at the house at Capernaum, when his parents and brother had come down to see him. And standing outside, they sent word to him and called him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Behold, your mother and your brothers are outside looking for you. Answering them, he said, Who are my mother and my brothers? But looking about at those who were sitting around him, he said, Behold, my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. When I pondered this passage on Thursday morning, I was blown away by the enormity of that statement. Behold my brothers, my sisters, my mother. In that moment, Jesus incorporated all those who were with him as his own family. His own family. And, and, I, and as I pondered what that meant, I thought, wow, that's me. I'm a part of his family. And I must have spent 20 or 30 minutes then just with my eyes shut, my heart open, as I just tried to absorb this swirling, whirling set of ideas about what it meant. And then Michael rang me up on Thursday afternoon. He said, would you like to preach on Sunday? I said, what, this Sunday? Yes. Oh, Okay. Got no idea what, but I'll give it a go. And it was only about 10 minutes later that I went back to this passage. And I thought, this is what God's telling me to say to people. So this morning, I want to focus on the family. And you see in these verses here that the family came basically to rescue Jesus. They'd come from Nazareth to Capernaum. Jesus had been ministering to all around the ridges and people were coming from him for miles around to the point where when he retreated to Peter and Andrew's home, most likely at Capernaum, the crowds were there and his parents, they were concerned about all this hype that was going on about him. All, all this sudden fame was like you know, being mobbed by a Taylor Swift concert or something. You know, he was just... It, 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 nobody could get to him, and his family were concerned that he was maybe out of his mind. And so they came down to rescue him, the previous verses had said. Now the crowd spoke to Jesus and said, look, your, your brothers and your mother are here. Your family's here waiting to get to you. They can't get in. Who? They spoke to Jesus on the human plane, on the natural plane. Your family is here. He said, and typical of Jesus, his response to that lifted it from the natural plane to the spiritual plane. And he said, here's my mother and my brothers. Jesus always lifted from the physical to the supernatural, from the natural to the, the spiritual. And this morning I want to just share some of the thoughts that swirled around in my mind on Thursday morning and which Thursday afternoon helped me to I tried to shape them into some kind of order so I could actually communicate them in some way rather than just feel them. And it seems to me that there are three dimensions to family when I can find them. Right, now I've got it. I don't know how I do this thing, but uh, we'll see what happens. <laughs> it's one of those mornings, isn't it? The music, the microphones, the, the data. Uh, <clears throat> it's a worrying thing when they put a machine like this in my hand. But the first thing I want to say is family is relationship. And the key marker of this is, key marker of any relationship is that we do not exist as an isolated, independent existence, but our entire being as family is wrapped up in a multiplicity of two-way relationships. 
you know, in any group of people, there's always a number of relationships going on at once. Now, in this room, I haven't had a Ken head count, but just for the sake of example, if there are 30 people in this room at the moment, there are currently 870 relationships going on. How I relate to Ron is one relationship. How Ron relates to me is a second relationship. How I relate to Carol is one relationship. How she relates to me is one relationship. How Ron relates to Carol. How Carol relates to Ron. See what I'm getting at? Mathematicians have worked out in group dynamics that the number of relationships in a group is a product of the total number multiplied by one less than that number. Because for every 10 people, are having nine relationships. So in 10 people, there are 90 relationships going on at once. Now, I think it would be interesting if we had a few hours to analyze some of the relationships happening in this room right now. How am I relating to Michael right now? Okay, I've just come in as a new member of the church and I'm delighted to have done so. And I'm feeling good about it. I'm feeling... A lot of things about that. But that, how is Michael relating to me? He's listening to what I'm saying. And what's his response to that imminently? Is he excited? Is he happy? Is he saying, I wish this bloke would shut up and get out of here? <laughs> I don't know. doesn't matter. But it's happening. And we never do anything in our life outside of a relationship with our family. Everything I do as a father, a husband, a a a brother, I was going to say a sister, but I, I, no, uh, everything I do as a member of the family is both shaped by my membership of that family and it also shapes my family. Relationship. The markers of a relationship in our family are these three things, I think. Familial love, familial loyalty and familial protection. Familiar love is not emotion-driven. It's more, if I can say it, a blood thing. You see it even when we're cranky with one another. We're still going to defend them furiously against any threat. We'll protect them. <clears throat> I get into trouble when speaking about family at the best of times, but when I'm putting a title up, the focus on family, then I'm going to be in more trouble still with my family because I'll use illustrations, as I've said before. If I have been given permission today uh, to speak about family members from my past, not my present. So I'm going to use a simple little illustration of what I mean by these three things by referring to my older sister. When I was a little kid, I had two older sisters. I still do have, by the way, uh, a couple more as well, younger. But I grew up as a kid with two older sisters, two years, four years older than me. My older sister, <clears throat> when I was five in grade one or whatever it was, she was nine. So she was older and I'd never lot to do with her. I was more relating to my younger sister. And so my older sister was in the upper part of this little one-teacher school we went to, and I was in the lower part. So we didn't see much of each other apart from across the room. <clears throat> my family was not a, a family that was given to education. And we had a very difficult childhood, particularly my older sister. She was a precocious young girl. She grew rapidly, physically matured before she was you know, mature enough to handle it. And while she was bright and pretty and sociable and so on, by the time she was about 11, she lost her way. I won't go into the sort of details, but it wasn't pretty. And so by the time she was 14, she left school and she was working somewhere and, and getting a life in a mess. But she saw me, her little brother, as doing something worthwhile. <clears throat> and... One day, later on in my teens, when I was trying to go to university, my sister came home from work. She'd saved her money, and she presented me with a leather briefcase. Shouldn't have used this one. <laughs> and said, you go to university. 
It's what she always wanted to do, but never could. That's family love. She didn't get there. I did. 25 years later, she did too. The hard way. I had it easy. She had it the hard way. But also when I was a little kid, <laughs> when I was about six or seven, and she was getting on to about 11, she was growing and she got a bit chubby. And I used to be the standard little pesty brother calling her names. I won't go into those either right now, but, uh, but suffice it to say, they, they were not very complimentary. And one day I was in the schoolyard calling her names while I saw her across the yard. Hey, you know, yeah. And my mate joined in calling her names. So I belted him. <laughs> and he said, what did you do that for? You, you did it? I said, yeah, I'm allowed to. I'm her brother. You're not allowed to. <laughs> That's family loyalty. Sure, I might carry on with my sister and tease her and all the rest of it, but nobody else is allowed to. My dad's better than your dad. You know, my dad said so, it must be right. You know, that sort of stuff. That's family loyalty the kids have. That's what we have as adults too. And the protectiveness. And the same school, the same schoolyard, the same sister, the same mates, sometimes... I was a bit of a wimp, and <clears throat> kids would bully me. And when my big sister across the school ground would see me getting out of her off time, then she'd come. And I tell you what, those bullies, they were confronted by the wrath of big sister, and she didn't let them get away with it. That's protection. My big sister and I didn't really have much to do with each other. But there's a very strong bond. She personified. Love, loyalty, protection. That's family. How does that operate in your family? How do you relate to other members of your family? Can you think of examples right now where you have acted in a way that shows that sort of familial love, even where people in the family you don't necessarily get on with all that well or even that often? A lot of us here have adult siblings, adult children, adult grandchildren, some of us, great-grandchildren perhaps, I don't know. But even though we don't see a lot of them, even though we don't always have an emotional strong attachment, they're still there, they're always there. And there are two further aspects of this. As well as in the church family and in our own natural family, there are two things that we need to be aware of. That is, right, okay, where am I, Nick? Right, that's it. <laughs> Thanks, Nick. <laughs> I'll give this away, I'll let you, you run it, you drive it. Uh, <clears throat> the two operational dimensions of this relational aspect of family, first of them is privilege. There's a privilege in being a member of family, and the key marker of this is we know we belong. I think it's very timely that Michael actually welcomed us into the membership of this church this morning. I didn't know it was happening until I got here. But I think it's very timely because it's appropriate to what I'm saying. See, we do not have an individual existence, but this two-way relationship is manifested in knowing we belong. And this is probably the greatest affirmation we can ever have, is to know that we belong. Young up-and-coming sportsmen will say, I didn't know I was good enough to be in the team, but now I've got involved and I'm scoring tries and I'm doing this and I'm making contribution. Now I know I belong here. And they're made, they're affirmed. Knowing that we, there's always somebody we can count on. In your family, in your natural family, I'll use that. Uh, as the differentiation between that and our Jesus family for a moment. In your family, when was the last time you called on somebody, you knew you had the privilege to be able to call on somebody in a time of need? Somebody in your family where you just knew that their love was guaranteed. 
I have two brothers in law. I wasn't going to talk about my family a bit. Peter and Paul, by the way, <laughs> funny. Yeah, yeah, how they are. Um, <laughs> I just realized that I call him by his proper name, Dieter, rather than Peter, which we often call him. Peter's a bricklayer, or was 20 years ago, and he's still in his 60s. Uh, <clears throat> When I had a new house, I had a bit of a drainage problem. I need a retaining wall. So I spoke to him about it. He said, I'll come and do it. I felt very free to ask Peter to come and do a brick wall for me. I'd worked with him as a labourer during my holidays. You know, I knew the good quality work he did and all the rest of it, but didn't hesitate to ask him. And he didn't hes hesitate to jump in and say, come on, let's do it. That was 20 odd years ago, 40 years ago maybe. But just last month, a few weeks ago, Paul, my young brother-in-law, is a car dealer, a car broker. And my granddaughter wanted to buy a car. So she came to me and said, Granddad, you've bought a lot more cars. I don't know how to do it. What do I do? I said, I know exactly what to do. Paul, <laughs> I ring up Paul, say, Paul, I need a car. Five days later, she's taking possession of the car with a deal that saved her thousands of dollars and you know, great stuff. I had no hesitation of calling on Paul. As my family member, when I offered to pay him once for finding a car for me years ago, he said, no, 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 this is family. Are there people in your family? When was the last time you reached out to somebody when you had a need? It might not have been a huge need. It might not have been a big car deal or, or a tra tragedy or anything like that, but simple thing. When was the last time you felt the privilege and acted on the privilege of asking somebody to do something for you when you need it. Sometimes we are too proud to do that. That's not family. Family is, hey, can you give me a hand? Being isolated from people is not family. When it comes to being members of Jesus' family, what a privilege it is to be able to call on people when we have a need. What a privilege it is to know that there are people here who are concerned about us, concerned about me. Uh, look, I've experienced this firsthand in this church. That's why I've come into membership, because of the affirmation of the people that I've met here. I've been able to work with them, being able to be rescued by them second op shop we had here earlier this year, I was working my daylights out and carrying stuff out, and by the end of it, I was, must have been going pale. And people came to me and said, sit down. They didn't wait for me to ask for it. I wasn't where I needed it, but I did. They brought me that drink of water. They sat me down. No big deal. Just last week. I'm going to really into trouble on this one. Um, <clears throat> At the op shop last weekend, Jan and I were up there getting stuff ready and we're going on. And suddenly Jan, Jan said, ah, you're bleeding. I said, oh, no, not again. Looked around. He had blood all over my arm. I hadn't known about it. I was too insensate. Uh, <clears throat> so I couldn't do anything about it. I couldn't get around to it. I said, Jan, can you fix this? They said, okay, wear our band-aids. And she came and she patched me up. So three or four days later, we're at the hampers. I bandaged up my arm around here before I came so I didn't get cut and out again. And we're running around the kitchen, and she says, oh, the bandages come loose. Jan, can you fix this for me? And, and Jan's just there, and Jan just fixes stuff when I need it. And now she's gone to the point of saying, look, let's get this packet of band-aids we put here for us to use whenever you need it. That's my privilege to have somebody like that looking after me. Now, it's a simple thing, isn't it? But that's the everyday household stuff that happens in family. It happens here. It's happened. I can give you 100 examples of that that's happened to me in this church in the last 12 months, where things like that have just happened because we're family, and I love it. So privilege, to be able to call on somebody when needed. And it's not just Band-Aid stuff I'm talking about. It's in times of grief, in times of joy, in times of need, 
There's always somebody there. When did you reach out and take advantage of that privilege recently with somebody in the church, somebody in your Jesus family? But the other side of family, the privilege, is family as responsibility. Every time somebody takes the privilege of asking, there must be a very response or else nothing works. If I said to Jan, can you get a Band-Aid? She just ignored me. I'd still be bleeding. If I asked Peter to do my brickwork and he said, find someone else, I don't know. don't know what would have happened. Nothing much. But you see, there is an inseparable connection between privilege and responsibility. We can call on somebody else, but also we must be prepared to respond to somebody else, to give. And this is typified by the commitment to support, to protect, and to provide. And it involves sharing, not self-serving. We may have differences of opinion about things. All families do. We may even bicker about some things. All families do. Jesus' disciples in that room did. But they got on with the job. And they supported one another. And they shared everything they had with one another. They protected one another. And that's what this church does so well. I've heard people discuss things, and I've heard differences of opinion, but no difference of family, no division of family. And that is a great, great thing. When we are asked to serve in a church, it is not any position to serve, it's a privilege to be able to take on that responsibility. The two things are two sides of one coin. When Michael asked me to fill in to, to speak this morning to share, I immediately said yes. And you know what? I didn't feel it was any imposition. I just felt, thank you for giving me the opportunity. And that was a, that was a, a genuine response because that's family. So, no, I'm again. Right, okay. <laughs> I just want to sum it up with a couple of thoughts here. What is family? It is not an accident of birth or geographical location. It is not just the people we happen to cohabit with. It's the people with whom we have an active, dynamic relationship. When we speak about our relatives, we use the word relative pretty loosely. But you know what the word relative means? All it means is one we have an active relationship with. We can be of the same blood, but not a family. We can be of different blood and a real family. My grandson taught me a wonderful lesson when he was 15. He is not my son's son biologically. My son married his mother and he was part of the deal. When he was a seven-month-old baby, my, my son married his mother. So he's not biologically linked to me at all or to my son, more to the point. <clears throat> and neither did my son ever actually legally adopt him, neither did he take my son's name. My son, his mother ultimately divorced my son and remarried when he was about 14. At 15, he walked out, couldn't stand this new man in his house. And so when I visited him when he was about 15, I spoke to my grandson and said, Justin, how do you cope with who's your father? And he said, no worries, granddad. Got it worked out. I said, what's that? He said, Don's my biological dad. Casey's my stepdad. Tony's my real dad. My son is the Tony. He's my real dad. He had it nailed. 
the person who lived in his house wasn't his dad. The person who begat him it wasn't his dad. But Tony was his real dad, the one with whom he had the most active, dynamic uh, personal relationship. So who is family? Well, all I can say about this is look around you. Look around this room. This is our family. This is our Jesus family. You are the brother and sister and mother of Jesus. Do you know what that means? Do you know what privilege that is? Occasionally I think of the royal family along this line. I think of Kate Middleton and Meghan Markle, to give them their former names. The way in which one has become a totally changed person because of the dynamic of the family, and the way in which the other one couldn't do so. There's a, a joy and a, a sadness in those two people. I'm not casting aspersions on anybody or, or eulogising anybody, but we've all seen that difference. Where the one took her time, didn't know whether she could handle being part of that family, <coughs> ultimately committed to it and has <clears throat> made it who she is. <coughs> the other one said, no, I can't handle it. We are members of Jesus' family. If we were to be married into the royal family, he would say, wow, my goodness, what a privilege, what an honour, what a burden, all those things. Jesus has anointed us to be his family. These are my brothers, my sisters, my mother. But there is a sting in the tail. Uh, if only I've made a bigger print. Uh, <clears throat> The key marker of Jesus' family. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and my mother. Despite common mythology that when I make a mistake, that's not who I am. That doesn't define me. That's rubbish. What we do is how we are defined. There's no good saying we are members of God's family it's what we do as members of the God's family that makes us such. Key word in that verse is does. Whoever does the will of God is my family. Friends, I am delighted to be a part of this family. I have a wonderful family of four sisters, a wonderful family of a wife, two children, five grandchildren. I love every one of them dearly. I'm proud of every one of them. And I love this family and this church. And I love being a part of Jesus' family. Please take on board the privilege and the responsibility of being a part of Jesus' royal family. Let's pray. Let's, let's pray. Father, we are delighted to be a part of your family. We are thankful. We are appreciative. We are willing to commit to take advantage of the privilege and to stand and take up our responsibilities. So, Lord, guide us, mould us, unite us as your family, Lord. May we go on and know that as people see us, they'll see you, the head of our family. Amen.